Or you could you can turn on the channels now, um, Emrys. Yeah, I already did. So they should okay. be all going. Okay, I see. All right. Then we'll start with our folks here. I think it's up on my hey. YouTube channel as well. So Great. it seems to be working. Yeah. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Did you want that direct link, uh, Henrik, or? Uh, no, it's, it's fine for now. Yeah. It's fine for now. OK, excellent. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the slight delay. My computer has been uh, being obstinate uh, lately with my Bluetooth headphones. And yeah, it is really, uh, really causing trouble with getting the meeting started. So I'll have to fix that soon. Um, but, uh, but welcome. And uh, this is the part where we kind of simmer and settle into this program, Phenotech Radio Hour. And we're doing some some fun, special stuff today. Um, if you are watching this live stream on YouTube on a channel called Sonata Secrets, that is a very uh, unique uh, happenstance. Uh, we have decided to uh, simulcast this live stream both to our own YouTube channel as well as our guests today's YouTube channel. Um, and so if you're over there, um, I'll let you know a couple of things. One, um, there's some links in the description of this uh, live stream for you to find out more about the program that we're doing today and, and what's behind it. And also, if you are actually catching this live and not recorded, uh, we're going to share a link either in the chat or the description of the of the stream that will allow you to jump on the Zoom call with us. So you could actually kind of be here even closer, you know, potentially interact and engage in the Zoom call, have a little bit more uh intimate experience, um, no pressure, but if you'd love to do that, we'd love to have you. And so look out for that registration link. We'll put that in the chat for folks to join us. And uh, usually I take a couple minutes to sort of let people shuffle in to the Zoom room, but basically at this point, you know, we've we've used up some of that time that we used to get started anyway. So I think we we're probably at, at a good number of participants. Now we can start introducing the program and, uh, and tell you what's going on today. Um, and so, you know, we, we kind of do an official introduction to introduce the program and we say, welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour. What we do here is we gather every Saturday to meet with and learn from the most fascinating and knowledgeable folks in the piano world. This could include manufacturers, rebuilders, musicians, makers of instruments. And of course, we have our foundation of piano technicians. Our mutual goal here is to become better at our craft to help each other and to create an ever more musical world together. Piano Tech Radio Hour is brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, an online learning resource that brings you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more at pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. This program, Piano Tech Radio Hour, is part of Piano Technicians Masterclasses. You subscribe to just this program for only $16 a month. You'll get direct access to each week's private Zoom call, as well as the archival recordings of about 200 episodes in our member area. It's about four years worth of content um, that you can access easily in our, in our member area at any time. You can join Piotech Radio Hour at bit.ly forward slash join PTRH, bit.ly forward slash join PTRH. And then uh, before we introduce our guest today, just to raise your awareness around some other things that's going on with us. Uh, in particular, we have the podcast, the Piano Tech Radio Hour podcast. So these video episodes come out as audio only episodes on the podcast. We both release archival episodes from about two years ago, as well as more recent episodes that are about a month behind um, the original recording date of those episodes. So go to pianotechradio.com to learn about the podcast and subscribe. And then if you want to know more about what's in our Piano Technicians Masterclass member area in the vault, you can check out our new blog that's been out for a couple of months, pianotechniciansmasterclass.substack.com. And pretty often, try to do it weekly or every couple of weeks, we're putting out an article that is based heavily on one of our master classes in the private member area. And remember, this is this is a higher level of education and in-depth um, inter in interactive uh, information than you get on the radio hour. This is really to up-level up your uh, professional expertise. 
However, if you just go to the public blog for free, you can get a lot of insights as to what's in those classes. And if you really like what you hear, you can go actually subscribe and check check out the, the archival information. You can also follow us on social media at Piano Tech Masterclass on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. And then uh, you can check out our most recent masterclass, which is on studying grand piano action geometry with Dean Rayburn. And you can sign up to watch the recording, pianotechnicismasterclass.com forward slash dean dash rayburn dash 2024. Um, Dean's been in the industry for like 40 years. He's built, you know, one of the most amazing softwares for piano tuning, um, in addition to now uh, being a professional action manufacturer and, and customizer. Really great information. And uh, we'll also share some information about our guest today. Uh, once we uh, once we get into the episode a little bit, but let's introduce that guest. <laughs> this is Henrik Schilham. <laughs> I'm yeah. trying to say the Swedish pronunciation of it. Pretty good. Yeah. Um, so I've given away that he's Swedish. He's a concert pianist, chamber musician, and accompanist. He's based in Gothenburg, Sweden. He works regularly with the Gothenburg Opera House Orchestra, as well as the Gothenburg Symphony Choir and Vocal Ensemble as a collaborative pianist in professional and educational settings. He plays solo recitals regularly uh, around Western Sweden. In 2019, just a handful of years ago, he founded the YouTube channel Sonata Secrets, which has now accumulated over 40,000 followers and 2.5 million views. In videos on the channel, he gives enthusiastic explanations for how classical music works with an analytical perspective while presenting and playing the pieces. The videos are accessible to listeners who might not be as familiar with classical music, and it has become a resource for piano players of all levels. Henrik, thank you for joining us. What is it, evening time in Sweden right now? Yeah, it's uh, eight o'clock. Thanks so much for having me on, Ethan. I appreciate it. Invitation. Yeah. It's been a pleasure um, to get to know you. We've had some conversations preliminary to this uh, this broadcast. And, uh, you know, I'll just say up front here, I mean, I'm always really appreciative when uh, we can share something that's, you know, culturally enriching um, that goes deep into the, the details of something very special and cultural like classical music. And people are getting excited about it, you know, um, to have lots of followers tuning in and checking out what you're doing. It's really wonderful to know about that. And as I'm, I'm a music nerd, I'm a music theory nerd, and I can nerd out about all kinds of, you know, uh, all kinds of chord changes and rhythmic changes and motifs and all this stuff. But it's so wonderful to know that uh, I've got a, a fellow community of, of those folks um, that, that can resonate with these type of things. Yeah, there's um, a lot of them chord changes and, and stuff. <laughs> I never run out of material to do videos on. That's that's a yeah, thing. yeah. And if you ever run out, uh, you can always go bleed into microtonal scales, and uh, you know you've got an an yeah. infinite number more chord changes to work with. Yeah, why not? Um, okay, so welcome here. Um, I'd love to just sort of we like to lay a foundation, oftentimes with our guests. Tell us a little bit about you know how you got started with music and piano in general, and how that might connect. With where you are today yeah sure so i am um, pretty standard piano education i guess for someone who uh, continues as long as i have i started when i was six years old with a suzuki method mm -hmm. an old uh, lady uh, local and i got another teacher when i was 12 who was really good and inspiring so i auditioned and got into the music academy after i finished school at 18. Um, and then I did one year on the bachelor program in performance there. But then I did a year on an engineering program, like mathematics, because mm. uh, I, I hadn't really committed. It was like I have to audition and I got in, so I had to give it a try. But then like in my family, what would be a more traditional route to do that type of education where I come from academics and no, no musicians really. Uh, but then after a year of that, I could kind of compare and I said, piano is much more fun than the music path. So if that's a viable option, it's I should definitely do that. And it seemed that I could do it. So then I committed. So I did like the full 
track of education after that, finished the bachelor. And then I did one year exchange studies in UK, north of UK, Newcastle. And then I went back to Gothenburg for a master's. And then I had kind of two years when I was half in the academy and half outside. I worked a bit at the student union for a year. But I somewhere around here, 2015, 16, I... Um, uh, I cut the ties as well. And I've been working as a musician on freelance basis since then. So like, is it eight years now, I think? Uh, so the it generally consists of, of three things where the Sonata Secret, Secrets is the third that's uh, come up since 19. So that's five years now. And the other two are uh, working as an accompanist and collaborative pianist, as you said so nicely. In the beginning, I uh, worked with a lot of um, students and choirs and some singers. It's like the main thing. A um, little bit of orchestra piano with, with those orchestras. And then the other side is like the flip side, the, the projects that I'm really passionate about, about myself. So like I, I do a, a big program per year, maybe uh, of recital programs, some sonatas and uh, play some concerts in smaller venues in Gothenburg. Uh, occasional piano concerto, like last year, I have had the nice invitation to go back to Newcastle and play Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto with the amateur orchestra there. Uh, so that's musical highlight from last year. Um, but then these two things fit really well together. So all this repertoire that I do, like in concerts, I do videos on them uh, and that's how it started. All the repertoire that I had played, I uh, started to do videos. And all. So that's pretty general, the situation. And then of course, COVID was a part of this when it came in. Yeah. yeah and you, but you started actually before COVID, right? Kind of posting videos and getting started with this stuff, which is interesting. Similar to what we were doing. It was back in 2017 when I was like, oh yeah, you know, we should be using modern technology to spread education throughout the globe. And, you know, at that point, it, it you know, we had some hardcore fans and we definitely couldn't have started this this uh, organization without our core fans. But, you know, there were a lot of people who were like, I don't know, I don't get it. You know, I don't need I'll do things in person. And then, of course, the pandemic hit and it was like, oh, I get it now, <laughs> mm. um, which was was like that for a lot of things, um, you know. I would like to just dive in here. I guess when you started the YouTube channel, you know, I'm sure you had a, con a concept. You probably built upon it and modified it. Um, I'm curious how you think about, how you've thought about this process, right? Has, has it changed a lot? Do you have like kind of like a model or like a template for how you've done these? How much thought did you kind of feel like you had to put in before you got started versus it's sort of naturally evolving how you present these things. How do you put the presentation style together? Yeah, so um, I can start when when it started for me, like how I first came about it. So, I mean, it's ended up being this kind of package of things that I do, um, some background and the context of the, the pieces. And then I play and I try to connect the analysis and structure and theory but also like the playing is very integral to it uh, to come really close to the music. Uh, and when I started, it was a couple of things that I had been going around in the back of my head for a couple of years, I think. Uh, and one of them was that it's uh, a bit frustrating with the elusive nature of live music because you do it and then it's no evidence that it's ever existed <laughs> except for in the memory of the audience. I mean, that's also what's what's unique and great about it. So it's a, a paradox. But I, I kind of wanted to do some documentation of it uh, and not just my playing to do like a music recording only. That's one thing that's also uh, important to do and uh, have it pure music in that way, but also like my understanding of it or my interpretation of it. Uh, and that's one thing. And then another thing is like, I did these kind of presentations at uh, when I did some concerts, recitals in these small venues in Swedish. And I always got good feedback from the audience that they appreciated doing that, like take some context. 
Um, so I guess I had some way of thinking that made sense to other people because <laughs> it, it always made sense to me to do that. And I, I guess I have to thank a professor at the academy who actually it's Gothenburg yeah, is an academy of music and drama. So we have some acting programs as well. And it's a professor from the drama side who worked with all the mu uh, music students to get comfortable presenting on, on stage. Uh, so I, I think I got, got a lot from her, Gunilla Gordfeld. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah. And then it's I, I kind of looked around at the digital world. In This was in 1819 when I did the first pilots. And uh, I launched in May 19. So I had kind of built up a few, done a few videos. Um, and then I launched uh, them closer together. Uh, but it, it just felt like the trend of the digital uh, world is so much potential in there. And YouTube is a great platform. I think the reach is incredible over the world to make connections like this. And also monetization is a thing that uh, I get a little bit of income, not much really, but a little bit. And also Patreon. Uh, I have. I don't know if there is any Patreon who found the registration link here uh, to this call, but... Uh, Anyway, I gained some Patreons over the years uh, that works very well together, I think. And in general, this is a just great trend for the digital environment. And finally, I, I also had some experience working with video from my youth years. We, we did uh, recorded uh, films with a group of fr friends. Like we had seen The Godfather was like the best movie ever. So we did like nice. gangster movies. Oh, <laughs> nice. Friends. <laughs> So I you got really... post some of the. Can you post some of those to your YouTube channel? I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Think yeah, there are some, some fr fragment of it left, but <laughs> I, I'm not going to share that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday. Maybe someday. Yeah. Once you've earned it, I feel like like famous people once they once they've shown like how amazing they can be, they can earn you know showing some childhood project or something like that. That's kind of silly, but um, that that's interesting. Um, you know, I think um. One thing that stood out to me that you said uh, a little bit back is that you're working on these pieces sort of anyways, right? And and then you're sort of developing this content around them. And, uh, you know, I care, I, I care a lot about education and where it's going and, and sort of keeping track of, of, you know, how people can learn and grow and change. And it's an interesting pattern that I've noticed I've been doing a lot in podcasting, even in domains beyond this and uh something like what you're doing like a like a media type of program or like a podcast it's an incredible opportunity to learn right and to deepen your knowledge of things you know we do master classes you know we have to do a master class every month we're committed to doing it and so just by the nature of that i'm gonna participate in a master class on action geometry or participate in a master class on voicing or something like this and it be, it provides a or meet a person like you and learn more deeply about sonatas and musical analysis and um, so I really think this is an interesting it's an educational model that I think people don't realize that when you start to create content it becomes a way to almost you know do a PhD in whatever topic you're you're sort of creating content on. So speaking of that, you've written a a paper. Um, quite extensively, um, just kind of about your philosophies of music. Um, and I'm trying to remember what the title of the paper is. Is it like how music works or yes, what's the title? How mu exactly. How music music works. Uh, I, I guess you go, you'd call it a paper. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not really defined. Um, I have it up as like a extensive blog post on my, it's on my webpage, sonatasecrets.com. You can read all the text there. Then I also have it in a formatted version as an ebook. Yeah. Whatever that means. <laughs> I'm gonna do a, a screen share, and you 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 know you can describe it a little bit, but I'd love to kind of show people what we're what we're talking about to be interesting. Yeah, but I I let's start uh, talking. Um, so it kind of comes from the same well of interest and inspiration as the uh, videos that I do, but the videos are always like applied to a specific piece. So I take look at all the stuff. Um, in the music that happens there. 
Uh, but then if you ask the question, okay, what is it about this particular place in this piece? Why does it behave this way and work well in this context? And then if you ask what's specific about that piece and what's true in general and like for a style, those are interesting questions. So this uh, paper is kind of trying to take this, uh, put it all into a model to see. And it's really been like what you said about if you, you learn by doing. I, I started writing, didn't really know what it would come of it, but I've always had, I've read some, had the interest of, of reading about this kind of aesthetic philo philosophies and theories. And somehow uh, I felt that I needed a model for it uh, firmer ground, philosophical ground, uh, what what I speak to in the videos. I mean, the videos are are more practical, also. Like I'm, it's not. So this is, uh, I it's more theoretical. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I would love to maybe pop on your channel really quickly. Uh, we we didn't sure. exactly plan this ahead, but I think we can impromptu do it. I, I, what I would like to do is um, is kind of share the screen here. And, uh, and and as always, folks, if you if you have prob problems seeing or hearing something, just let me know and we'll fix it. I can't always tell how it sounds to you, but I'm going to, um, I'm going to share the screen. Um, and I'm doing a, are you seeing, are you seeing it the YouTube a channel, bit guys? Pixely. Th that's better. Better. Okay, got it. And then um, what I'm curious is, is there any, you know, of course, some of these are 20 minutes long or something like that, but I'm curious, is there anything you could think of among what we're looking at here where it might be interesting to kind of watch a clip or uh, or check out a small segment of something? Yeah, sure. I, I can, um, I can uh, show you, if you take the latest one uh, about the list piece. List visionary. Uh, okay. Yeah, we can do like thirty seconds in the beginning and then jump to like wow. six minutes wow. in. Um, yeah, we'll get this. We'll let this ad play through, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, th that, that would you. be a good like thank introduction, our... like a two-minute uh, thing where I, I okay. talk about the first chord in that uh, piece. That's latest. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. The romantic ideal of the suffering artist, a young soul experiencing emotion. How do you illustrate musically the romantic ideal of the suffering artist, a young soul experiencing emotions to the fullest, from tender vulnerability to ecstatic joy, but also intense sadness and suffering, and questioning what it all means in despair? Franz Liszt does it perfectly in his epic tone poem Valet Dobermann, or Obermann's Valley starting from the very first chord. It's a lot of pain and suffering here. So it's A minor 7 in the right hand, but with the F sharp as a syncopation in the left hand makes it very unstable. Especially the dissonance between the F sharp and the G. But it's resolving. At last, the E minor second inversion, another suspension on the beat. Could you pause here, maybe? Ethan? Yeah, I'm gonna pause here. Yeah, I can. Right. This is this is so meta. Me watching a video of myself. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I can just uh, say here that I, I heard this at a at a, um, a summer piano course in southern France. Uh, mm -hmm. like some 10 years ago or something. And it was something with this very first chord that really struck a note with me. And like the teacher uh, showed it uh, also in some way. So here I'm just like living through that. <laughs> what is this chord that's such a special character? Uh, and may maybe we can jump to, if you go to 6.30, okay. I will like, because after this is... Uh, a lot of like background, historical background and stuff. You can watch it uh, later if you want. Okay. Uh, but sure. here I, I continue with this phrase. So I've, oh. uh, I started with that hook a minute of that before the introduction part. So 6.30, you will get the rest of the phrase, which is also an interesting thing, I think. Okay, let's play it. It's first. Yeah, okay, we get this again, heard it now. 
And here we could resolve this phrase to the implied key of E minor if it was like this. That would settle the tonality from the start. But Liszt, instead of this, he turns immediately to somewhere else harmonically. Okay, you can so pause there and maybe. Minor. Yeah. Very cool. Um, anything to say about that that part, or just kind of wanted to show the sort of changes? Yeah, no, in the yeah I, I was just thinking. So now I there's some symbols that comes up, and and um, sometimes I don't go through them all in detail. Like here, I don't mention them more. Uh, uh -huh. So it's a little bit. It's always hard when I do the videos to know which where I which level I should put it on because the audience can be very different levels. Right, uh, yeah. But I try to like not do. Uh, there's like a, a, a threshold that I don't explain, like the most basic terms, like piano and forte. Um, I count on, you know what that is. Uh, but then I also don't go higher than, like not too deep in the woods uh, either. Right, right. Like, like, like way too theoretical, right. But yeah, it's an interesting level. And um yeah, this this raises the question too, and thank you for sharing and getting us through that. It, you know, I, I was thinking about it. You know, you're, you're sharing these videos, and of course, you wrote this paper, and and it's also also wonderful to see people just sort of this flows out of you. You know, you're doing this because you want to. It's not like somebody assigned you to do any of this stuff. It's great your passion for this. Um, how much time do you end up putting into the production of a video or or writing your paper? Is it something where you Put an hour in every day to the paper over the course of several weeks or months like how does this stuff come together what's the time involved yeah so the paper is very special it it's like been years in the making i i read some uh books um like i found some great book and i read it over a summer and then next year another book uh, and then it was like a couple of weeks of more intense working with some chapters and then i came back to it so um that's more special with the videos i i started to build systems from the from the onset of like what do i need to do to get it all together so it's like five stages of work <laughs> the first is learning the music uh as a pianist um which is as we said i usually i've done that before like in for other reasons uh, but that has um that's a lot of the like heavy lifting of a video is already done there because if I have played the music, I know it in, in the hands, what it's about a lot. And then the second stage is like putting this uh, analysis together, uh, do a extra bit of research, like get all the years right. And I actually write uh, a script that's uh, really been a, a process. Um, uh, it's come together so now I know exactly what works for me, but it took, you know, tens and um, I think I've done 150 videos, something uh, in total. So around video a number 100, like I know what works. But before that, it's a lot of uh, some trials. Uh, but basically the introductions are more scripted uh, if it's more important exactly what's uh, what, how I want to frame it. And then I write in bullet points, uh, okay, this place is this chord and this um, motif, how they work. And I, the thing is, like, I, I find these um, descriptions, like a word or, or a term, or, and I write it down. And the, um, the important thing is to write it down, <laughs> then you kind of remember it. And then I write the script and I like go through it before I record. And then I kind of leave it on the desk and I record and don't look at it. Mm. But the process is to to write down the stuff. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. So ultimately, so, you don't actually read the script. You, you're kind of like playing through it from memory after rehearsals. Yeah. And improvising a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Not the, not the introductions. It's, it's a little bit uh, different. Okay. And like I do usually 20 minutes of recording time is like the the standard uh after that i get too tired in the brain so intense to do it's both the talking and the playing like either one is fine but to, it's it burns extra uh, calories in a way uh 
so like 20 minutes then I, I I take a pause and kind of read the next part of the script if it's so it if it's uh, several movements or several sections of a piece I divide it uh, like it's one or two pages of a script yeah and I very practical matter I r- realize I write the script in Word and I have the font size to 14, which is very big, but it's so I can just hold it and read it. I don't need to look at it <laughs> close. It's very practical. I can recommend that. Uh, it's fascinating. So, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so that's the third thing, uh, recording. And that's mm-hmm. like, I have to set aside a day. And this is also something I've realized that because uh, uh, all the other work that I have is like, uh, accompanying a choir in the evening maybe or if I have a lunchtime concert this schedule for the week is like I see which days I can fit in a recording so that day if I'm recording a video I start in the morning I go through the script the last time and then two to three hours to set a, a, everything up and record and then I'm tired <laughs> so I like I can't do it on days where I have other work too so I, I, mm-hmm. I burn that energy for that day so how it feels like Hmm. Um, uh, so okay next stage is editing and that's also a lot of um, uh, what do you say Um, I have a a form in the editing software program I have pre presets you know uh, that I start with a lot already in place so then but then it's usually maybe eight 10, 12 hours if it's like a 20 minute video, somewhere around there. Um, and the final stage that also I didn't think of when I started, but you realize as soon as you start the YouTube game is I call it the publishing stage. So everything mm. to make a thumbnail and make the description and like put the links out in, in all the channels. And I, I, um, I write the special update to my Patreon page with a more personal approach that I'm really happy about. Like I share, it's more an exclusive community to the Patreon. Say so now I have this new video and they know, like I share monthly updates, what I'm working with in general. So uh, it's, you get a little extra uh, know how it works from the Patreon yeah. side. But that's basically all the stages. Wow. It's a lot, you know, and and again, I feel like I'm just a very uh, impressed by your passion and also appreciative that, it, that you're connecting with an audience over it because that's a lot of work and it's great to have some appreciation and some fans and, you know, people to resonate with. Um, I want to take a minute and and start talking about your pianos a little bit because this, yeah. this is our piano nerd show. Um, so I, we noticed in your videos that you have a couple of different pianos uh, that you that you use for the videos. Am I right? Do you have two pianos or do you actually have three? And do you have one that you don't use? Is that correct? Yeah, I actually have three. The and first one I, I don't use house, at all. Do you have three pianos? No. So you see here, this is um, the upright that I have uh-huh. in my apartment. Okay. Uh, so from uh, the first uh, piano I had, my... Um, my parents we bought it when i was living at home and as a teenager it's a grand piano a vendel and lang a chinese brand that is it has a very nice tone like very loud sound and quite piercing but very nice tone quality but it's very heavy in the keys and it's a bit strange that it's so hard to play so it's it's really hard to like practice the the fast classical stuff and like especially it's uh, when you hit the key from a, a bit from the side, it's really tough to, I don't really know why that is, but anyway, I've never recorded any videos on that. Um, we know, we know why that is. We, we can figure it yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell me? Um, well, I mean, part of it's going to be the construction of the piano, um, you know, you know, lower quality materials and angles that are slightly off and things like that. It could be part of it. Um, but actually, that's kind of interestingly enough, this masterclass that, that we just did with Dean Rayburn that I mentioned up front on action geometry. Um, so there's there's a couple of different aspects. Um, the action geometry is is the the geometry of the action, right? The angles that the different parts interact 
And so you have a uh, you have basically three different levers in the piano action. One is the the piano key itself because it goes up and down, right? And then you have another lever that's called the whipping, you know, and it goes up and down. And then you have the hammer is another lever. Mm -hmm. And those three things kind of push on each other going up and down. So you can imagine that in order to get good leverage, you have to approach things at the appropriate angle. So like mm -hmm. if I'm going to push this and I push it like this, I'm going to get more power than if I happen to act, be pushing it slightly off direction. And so there can be natural issues with the actual geometry of the action because you can imagine it's hard to get everything lined up, design it properly, have the know-how you know, in-house for the manufacturers to get it the way it's supposed to be. And so that can be off and that can affect the playability, right? It's going to play like a truck is something that people mm -hmm. say. And, and that can happen, um, for example, if the, if the other end of the key, there's a part called the capstan and it pushes yep. up on this other part called the whipping. And if that capstan is not aligned uh, very well with the, the whipping cushion, at an angle or offset that that doesn't give it optimal leverage, that can play like a truck, you know? Mm. And then the other thing is just the regulation. Now the regulation is a more optimistic uh, problem. So if it's just the regulation, which is just basically- Yeah, no, no, that, I had it, the uh, I, I put it in for a, a um, extensive service. So, so they did all that and it didn't help uh, that. It, it helped help. a little, but not, I think it's more, yeah, it makes sense. It's so a lot of different things inside there. Yeah. So that's yeah. very apropos to the class that we just did. You know, it, it's yeah. this action geometry. There's probably some things going on with the action geometry um, if they already address the regulation and it's still just kind of not functioning mm. well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, so I, I've had that for my uh, my teenage years. But then I moved. I in the academy. I practiced at the at the school all those years. I moved away from home, and then I um, uh, when I graduated the masters, I started to rent a studio space. So I in the beginning I moved this uh, mm. uh, Wendel and Lang grand piano there, uh, but then I realized I wanted to have a piano in my apartment also. Uh, so I bought this upright. Uh, which is an old German brand, uh, Ronish. Ronish. Sure. Yeah. Uh, that I'm we don't, very happy with. We don't with. see many Ronish in um, in the United States, mm. but I lived in Peru for about a year and a half, and that was a major brand that I saw okay. um, in Peru. Actually, there's a quite a connection between Peru and Germany. So yeah. Okay. I'm familiar with it. They're beautiful yeah. pianos. Yeah, very, very good. I think it's a hundred years old or something, but I think it, it stood very still. It led a still life. It must have been because it's very good um, um, capacity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then finally, uh, only three years ago in the summer oh, of 21, I bought um, an, another uh, grand piano. Just a second, let me mute that. Yeah, Just, sorry. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I bought a, a Yamaha C3 uh, second hand that okay. I found on uh, used pianos uh, like a Craigslist in uh, region. So I took a two hour drive and, and tested it and I can sense there was something in the tone, but it was way too, too soft the tone, uh, like it didn't come out, but there was some register where it came out. So there was something strange had been going on, I think. So uh, I bought it and then I have a piano technician I work with in Gothenburg that I'm, we have a good collaboration. So I kind of, uh, he came and looked at it and we made a plan how much we, he thought we should work with it. So it, it took some time to like do all the planning and also piano technician seems to be busy people. So he, you know, he, I have to book him a couple of months in advance, but in the end he came to work three full days on it. So do a lot of full service and, voicing of the hammers to like file them down or what do you say yeah uh, voicing yeah, yeah. file uh, to get uh, the sound out and in the end it's really good uh, so that's um, uh, since last by the way by the way let's have a, a shout out to your piano technician what, what's your technician's name there again and you said he has a brother that also is the technician that's right uh, magnus Eriksson is my technician and his brother Bengt Eriksson, they are uh, they 
do a lot of piano tuning and servicing in Gothenburg at the big institutions. Wonderful. And I'll, I'll take this opportunity to share because I always love this. So we were talking about reaching an international global audience. So I've, I've been sharing this in the emails. I don't know if people have noticed. We actually changed some of the, the statistics. Um, but oh. here's some of our, our rankings for the podcast. In the, so this is in the performing arts category on, on Apple, you know. And um, and so these, this is basically the highest rank that we've achieved at, in these different countries in performing arts category. And we have actually reached number six in Sweden. Wow, that's amazing. Performing <laughs> arts category. Um, of course, this sometimes depends on the weeks and, you know, it depends on the particular episode. But maybe on your ep- when your episode comes out, <laughs> um, maybe we'll get back. We'll get a, a high ranking in Sweden as well. But um, again, but yeah, yeah, it's interesting to kind of see the countries where you where you get to make connections and, and contact. Do you see that you are. Um, well, we'll get back to your pianos in a second, but do you see the majority of your audience is it did it start out locally did it actually start out in the united states like can you tell do you look at those youtube statistics like who's actually keeping track of what you're doing uh yeah sure so i took the decision to do it in english uh from the from the start i i was thinking a lot when i wanted to start something with all these things i had in the going on in my in the back of the head uh, but it was two decisions one was should i do uh, audio only as a podcast that would would be easier production wise but i ended up choosing video to do the video too for you have yeah for all those reasons actually i also release all the episodes as podcasts uh, okay. you can find them like on spotify because okay. most of it works only with the audio yeah uh, but of course you don't see the score so it's it's a uh, such a different and then the second thing was uh, in swedish or in english and it's also like Swedish would be easier for me to do, uh, but English is uh, much more potential. Mm-hmm. Um, but what was, right, the audience. The audience, like where yeah. are people listening and did it start yeah, out? Yeah, so Sweden is it? very low because we're oh, really? a very big country. Yeah, uh, okay. it's, it's basically the US and Europe, I think, is around equal. Uh, okay. Pretty, it feels like it's pretty much like OECD countries, very general Um Okay. Well, and so, okay, getting back to your piano. So you got the Yamaha C3, you did some voicing, you kind of tried to fix it up. Um, and and we gave a shout out to, to your piano technician. Tell us a little bit, because this is always, you know, interesting for us to understand the collaboration between you and your piano technician and sort of deciding what to work to do and, you know, how much to invest and like kind of choosing the piano and, you know, communication issues, things like that. Anything interesting to share there? Yeah, well, it's it's been like a long. Re- it's starting to be feel more like we have a long working relationship. So I don't remember. I it probably was bigger issues uh, the early years, but that was like seven years ago, five years ago. So I don't remember what I was thinking then so much. Um, but I, I bought it myself without uh, consulting with him um, because I it was the right time and uh for me to buy and i found it and it 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 was the right range and it felt like a good instrument and then i basically we realized that uh, he could do a lot with just going over it um and then so i'm he, he says that i'm i'm more uh, interested than than most other clients <laughs> that uh so i kind of uh Try to to learn a bit what he's doing to so I I can do a little bit of uh, things by myself um, like the, some easy stuff I leave a lot to the professionals but like so when he's tuned and done the voicing we actually did now uh, in January he came again for like a half day or a day to uh, go over it uh, and I think it's a good like two years ago to do that because uh, I wanted to have really high quality and I practice a lot on it. So it's, uh, it, it, it does well with it to, to be looked after in that way. But so he, he went over and did some adjusting a little bit of the voicing again, like some notes changed a bit over the years, sure. yeah. <laughs> but then like after he's done, I, 
I go over it and if there's like one or one note I feel I can do a little bit softer maybe I I, I pluck a hole with a needle in the hammer <laughs> uh, okay. but yeah so you've learned a little bit of voicing techniques and he's yeah. kind of shared that yeah he showed me a little bit yeah um, but I'm very careful. I, I know it's a uh, it's a whole whole different domain that I I'm I'm a novice in. So I have a lot of respect for technicians. Wonderful, as you should. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> but um, but yeah, you know, we often talk about on the program. I think about um, you know, the collaborative relationship between piano technicians. Uh, you can include manufacturers as well. And the and the musician, you know, um, really, it takes uh, it takes that group of folks to really make the music happen, right? And it's a different piece if you have a piano with a different technician, right? That's working on it, that can highlight things, that can bring out the sound, um, change the regulation on it, right? All those different things make a difference, and they contribute to the music. Um, I have looks like I have a question from Lee on YouTube. Uh, Lee on YouTube asks, what is your favorite upright piano to play? Do you have a favorite upright? Is that, that for me? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's for you. Yeah. Well, uh, my answer is right now is going to be my Ronish there. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I, I do prefer grand quite a lot over uprights in general uh, because it's def dif different mechanics of it. Um Let's see if Lee has has their favorite upright. See if Lee we get Lee to tell us what their favorite upright. <laughs> maybe they have an opinion, or maybe they haven't developed one yet. But, I, you but, know, but I, just... I've also played like a new Yamaha's upright uh, uh -huh. can be really good. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm always surprised. Not that these are my favorites, but um, I'm always surprised. You can't even come by these pianos anymore. They don't make them literally like they used to. These kind of very tall, almost like a bar room upright piano. So like very big, you know, very tall. Um, and I'm I'm always pretty impressed. I came across quite a few of those when I was doing tunings in New York and how great they can sound, you know, and it makes sense because they're taller, they can have longer strings. Um and uh and not necessarily a specific brand, but um but uh but not bad. And you know, saying not necessarily a specific brand, I've actually sometimes been particularly unimpressed with Steinway uprights. Sometimes Steinway uprights, the Steinway name makes you feel like it's gonna be this amazing instrument, and then you know, there can be issues with the piano and especially from a technician's perspective, like caring for it, they're not always engineered perfectly. Um, Lee says their favorite is a Furic one two three Vienna. Was their favorite upright piano? Thanks, I, Lee. I Thanks can't say question. I know know that uh, model. Mark. Yeah, um, where it's, it's pronounced Feurich, Feurich, or I think Feurich in German or Feurich. something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think actually they they got bought up by uh, by this Chinese company that makes the Wendel and Lang grand pianos. So, so if you buy a new Feurich Grand, it's the same mechanic as the the first piano we were talking about. Uh, but okay. I think yeah, an upright is uh, so it depends on the the year, <laughs> which brand. Yeah, you know it's interesting to talk about you know favorite pianos. Like I have an upright piano that that my mother purchased when I was in high school. It's a a Samic piano, and um, and Samic is a, you know, it, it, they, they make pretty good pianos, but it depends on the, the year and, you know, whoever was owning it at the time. But it always reminds me, like, when we're advising someone to purchase a piano, ultimately, you know, the brand stops mattering, the year stops mattering, you know, all that really matters is, does this piano feel and sound good to you? You know, especially because you're going to have to keep it and and cherish it for such a long time. And so it, it's it's a little bit less like a car where you can say, oh, I want this make and model of a car and that it's going to be great. Um, it, it, there can be very specific uh, pianos within a specific make and model where, oh, that's a good one. I like that one. And oh, you know what? I don't like that one. It's the same make and model, but it's a different piano. So um so I get that. I get why yours is your is your favorite piano to work on. 
Um, well, we're, we got we'll, we can take about ten more minutes here because we started a little bit late, but we'll be wrapping up um, pretty soon. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you about like um, what your plans are for the future. You know, um, as you continue to develop the YouTube channel, develop your career, um, explore music and theory. Um, are you going to discover some grand unifying th theory of music, uh, even beyond what you've already discovered? You know? that, I've already done that. <laughs> you've already done it. You did it. Okay, perfect. Or well, like that's the model I've, where, uh, where sometimes you have thoughts coming up. So maybe there will be more writing as well, uh, but not um, concrete plans for that. So I have well, some. On that uh, note, on that note, before you go into the future, can you, can you, in, in a, in a, sentence or two share what your kind of final conclusion is but you know with your you know paper that you put together on, right. on music and what it's all about yeah yeah but i i, I think i can <laughs> it's yeah. uh it's like 80 pages of uh <laughs> writing but uh the general model is like okay you can think of it as four uh levels um, and because we, we talk about music very differently depending on level and they are, I call them the constituent level, the perceptive level, the structural level and the contextual level. So, um, and they interact, of course, but, uh, and they kind of emerge from the, you start with the, the frequencies of like pitch and amplitude that's the constituent level. We don't talk about music in that domain, but that's mm. what music consists of, uh, vibrations. Yeah, exactly. But then it's emerging from that. You get to the perceptual level. And here is where it's uh, important that we are uh, like humans. We're perceptive creatures. So we hear what we hear is we kind of evaluate that and uh, we hear notes and um, rhythms and these kind of dimensions of melody and rhythms and harmony. Uh, so that's the perceptual level. And then you kind of move up as emergent to the structural level. You get the stuff that you cannot compare because it's different points in time and it's longer than we can keep in the mind directly. Uh, so a lot of what I do in the chat, in the videos are about this, looking at the structure of the piece, both lo um, long-term structure uh, and short-term structure. And then the context is like around it it's a lot of different, like there's a, uh, what I call the musical context, musical context and extra musical context. Uh, so like, uh, yeah, I, I haven't, I don't think I have uh, fully um, made a, a, a co coherent model fully of that because there's so many di directions going out, but um, it helps me to think of it in these terms. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely. That was I, more than two sentences, but. <laughs> that's great. Uh, I, I appreciated it. Yeah, I, I mean, I specifically remember, I, I've always been a bit of like a music theory nerd and, and kind of like a structural nerd. And I, I remember that transitional period in my life, I, you know, probably teenage to college years. You know, I played the piano, I learned the basics. And, you know, really understanding, <laughs> I guess, especially when you start performing the music in front of people and seeing how they interact and engage and there's popular music and classical music. And then the, mm -hmm. there's like hip hop and jazz and all these different things um, that that highest level of things you realize, oh, you know what? It, it matters. Yes. Your technique, you know, and the chord changes and, you know, but, but, to, but a, ultimately, to a degree, right. yeah, to a degree, mm -hmm. but ultimately all of that really just serves the contextual level. And that really, although we can enjoy music from, from the just the, per, the sort of perceptual level and the structural level, that contextual level really supersedes everything. There's so many cultural changes at play and a history of music and all, all this stuff that, that comes into how we connect with and appreciate music for sure. Yeah, that's exactly where I end up in the last chapter. It's uh, connected to culture at large and and society and identity. It's, it comes in, and I, I that's where I s s draw the line to, uh, because it's I'm only looking at the music. So what? Yeah, from the music's perspective, where do we go from there? Mm. So we we sort of took a little sidetrack, but it's very informative. Um, going on to like your plans for the future, and and then right. uh, and then we'll wrap it up after that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, 
So the channel has been kind of an interesting point in time now because I had this long list of repertoire that uh, I said I talked about that I had been working on in in recital programs and stuff, and then I, I ended up with like a list of okay these great composers that I love and uh, feel that I have something to say about. Uh, I want to cover all of them uh, and all of their piano music that is important for for piano playing in general. So like you have these 15 composers, like that's it, all of them uh, that we play have something unique that they have contributed in, in music history. So I kind of, I wanted to touch on that. So I took some, um, like a couple of pieces from all of these composers. Um, so I kind of, I wanted to finish that list basically. And uh, it took a couple of years. But after the pandemic lifted, so 22 and 23, I kind of went down to a reduced level of production frequency because I uh, there was a lot of musician work coming back. Real I, life. I wanted to take. <laughs> uh, so we kind of went down there. And this Christmas, I, I finished that lift list perfectly, like what I had some idea that I, when I started. So now I'm kind of in a middle ground where I I still want to keep doing, but this semester I'm basically doing a little bit, even less, but like bigger pieces that I'm I'm still playing in them in programs. Uh, so it's a little bit different, but still what I'm doing. And then for the autumn is, uh, I want to, I plan to do more, uh, experiment more, um, uh, yeah, I, I I haven't decided on anything specific, but I'm I'm gonna have some more time to work with this and prioritize it, and uh, try some different things. But so before that, this spring is like the big thing I'm working on right now is to do a a recording in a professional studio with Scriabin's early sonatas that I have covered some on the channel. But it's like one of my favorite composers, and uh, I feel like I'm ready to do a proper recording. So uh, it's another fun collaboration with a, a studio technician who's also a piano technician. Like oh. Recently become a certi certified piano tuner in Sweden. Um, and and is that the brother of, of the one no, you're no, or somebody it's, else? No, it's a, another person in Gothenburg. Okay. He was, he's a double Bring bass player. Bring him into the fold. We need uh, more radio hour community. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, I will uh, uh, tip him. Uh, Johannes Lundberg. So he has a studio in central Gothenburg. And so I'm doing a couple of sessions with him uh, spread out over a, a couple of months. So next week I'm recording second sonata and the fantasy uh, in B minor opus 28. Uh, everything is very hard. So I need, need to practice a lot. So it's, it's also a reason for not doing as much videos right now. Uh, but basically that's the plans for the future. Wonderful. Well, we're looking forward to it all. And I, I've sort of been, I want to say it earlier in the conversation, but I thought I'd mention it um, just to give you a little bit of kind of input. You know, I, I heard that you mentioned that you um, had a, a, an act, actor kind of training you a little bit in your studies, right? And that, that around the presentation style of things. And um, I feel like I, I I really do appreciate. I can tell, you know, when you're when you're presenting it that you have that side of thing. Like you're intentionally putting mm. in kind of a you know like a like a flourish and a personality and and trying to bring that in. And I can see you, you know, you, you go whatever direction you you need to go. But I can see you leaning into that even more, you know, because I do appreciate the. It is important that it's video content and your kind of personality. And not only your personality, but the personality that you project, you know, like almost as a as a performer, um, that that is that's really wonderful. And and I hope it continues to develop and and become uh, more present. Yeah. No, thanks for saying that. I appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right. Well, we should wrap up. Um, it's been a wonderful session. Great to get to know you a bit better. Hopefully I'll see you in Sweden sometime. If you're ever in the States, we'll we'll connect um, and uh uh, I'll just let people know where to go to find out more about you. Um, you know, we send people to your website, of course, um, and so that's sonatasecrets.com um, and your your name, uh, 
Hendrik Kilham, uh, dot se is another place to go. Um, and yeah, then, course, I, it's only in up. Swedish. My the personal website I only okay. have uh, in Swedish right now. But yeah, the YouTube channel is probably the main point. You can find everything from there. Wonderful. Yeah, I'll just look up Sonata Secrets and probably come together. Um, all right. Well, I will say uh, uh, thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Um, in the this has been Piano Tech Radio Hour. Uh, we've reached the end of a, another musical journey. Thanks again for Henrik for joining us. As always, we're brought to you by Piano Technicians Master Classes, cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. For those of you that joined us today by signing up for this session individually, make your life more convenient. Subscribe to Piano Tech Radio Hour, $16 a month. You get the recording of today's session in our member area, automatic registration for each week's new session. Sign up there at uh, bit.ly forward slash join PTRH. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash join PTRH. And then, of course, uh, you know, remember to go to pianotechradio.com to check out the podcast, pianotechnicians masterclass.substack.com for the blog. And follow us on social media at pianotech masterclass, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and uh, and check out that most recent masterclass on action geometry with Dean Rayburn. We'll put the link in the chat. Um, so you could check that out. So thank you uh, again very much for joining, Henrik. Thanks for the audience for showing up. Thanks out there on, on YouTube. Thanks for your comments and, and interactions. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks so much for ha having me, Ethan.